Good morning, this is Pastor John. We're getting ready to begin our online worship experience here at New Lexington Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will begin in five minutes, so grab your family, grab your Bible, and join around, and, or gather around and join me back here in five minutes.
Good morning and welcome to New Lexington Baptist Church's online worship experience, which is now live again this week. Uh, we want to begin with a few announcements. First of all, the youth will be having a live interactive video Bible study on Zoom that will begin at 6.30. Uh, Jeremy, Pastor Jeremy, will contact the youth and give them the code to sign into that. Also, next Sunday is Easter. Boy, that's hard to believe, ain't it? It's here already. Uh, but we're excited about a couple of things we got going on for Easter. And the first one is we will be taking communion. Now you might wonder, how are we going to do this when we are not gathering together for worship? Uh, well, first of all, you can swing by the church this week and there'll be a Rubbermaid tub out back with these in them. And this is a little communion uh, cup that has a, the wafer on the top and the juice on the bottom and you just peel that open and uh, you pick up the right amount uh, for your family and any time over the next week and make sure you use hand sanitizer or wear rubber gloves when opening and closing the lid. We will have a hand sanitizer on the Rubbermaid tub on the top of it for your use. Uh, so be prepared next Sunday to take communion after the message. Also, uh, this week we're going to have a scripture egg hunt. Uh, starting Monday at noon, we're having a scripture egg hunt on Main Street in New Lexington. And it will, it's like a scavenger hunt, except for looking for eggs, you're going to look in windows of businesses uh, for a, I believe it's a picture of an egg with the scripture on it. Uh, for more details, check out our Facebook page. All right, now we want to gather together and honor God through worship and giving. Again, uh, even though we're going through a trying time, God has still truly blessed us, and it's important that we give back to the Lord for all that he has blessed us with. And even though the building is closed, the church is not. So some ministries might not be running, but others have sprung up due to the crisis that we find ourselves in. And it's important to support those ministries. There's two ways that you can give. The first is on our website, and that would be the easiest. It's at www.newlexingtonbaptistchurch.com. That's www.newlexingtonbaptistchurch.com. Go to Church Connect and Online Giving. There's a link there. And then click on the green box that says Online Given. Giving. Or you can mail in a check or money order to New Lexington Baptist Church, P.O. Box 656 or 656. And that's New Lexington, Ohio, 43764. Also, I want to encourage you to stay connected to each other. Give each other a call. Reach out to each other. See if... Uh, everybody is okay, uh, and if you need something, by all means, call us here at the church at 740-342-2260. We are delivering groceries and essential supplies to those who are shut in because of the virus. Now I want you to gather your family around, get your Bible, and join me for the next 60 seconds as we pray together to open up our service. Let's pray.
Good morning. Well, it's hard to believe, but today is Palm Sunday. So what does that mean? It means next week is Easter, and we have a special service planned, and uh, we're maybe going to have some special music. We'll see how that goes. And we may even have something extremely special if it's the Lord's will, so keep that in prayer. But today we're going to continue our series, Journey with John. Uh, and I've asked all along every week, and I've started out, if we're on a journey, what is our destination? Well, our destination in the book of John here is faith. And right off the bat in chapter 1, we find out that uh, John answers the question, who is Jesus? And he tells us that basically Jesus is God. And uh, John reiterates his purpose, and uh, or I want to reiterate John's purpose of the gospel, and that's found in John chapter 20, verse 31. It says, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John writes his book here so that you know that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you can have life. And he says, I've come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. But that's not just talking about life here on this earth. It's m the word life there is much bigger. It's eternal life. So John is writing this book again so that we can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God. Today we come to John chapter 2, verses 12 through 25. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to John chapter 2. Verses 12 through 25. What gets you worked up? That's a question I think that uh, this text brings to mind. Uh, I asked Tina I what, what got her worked up, and she said, well, when people start messing with your uh, husband and children. And I think most wives and husbands would relate, you know, what, me wor what works you up is if somebody messes with your family. Uh, but maybe it's you get in your car and it's dirty. And, you know, how many, peop how many people out there, you, you get in your car, you sit down, and you look around, and there's trash on the floor, and, uh, yeah, I, I know there's a lot of you out there, <laughs> and that just gets you all frustrated. Uh, or maybe uh, it's while you're in driving in your clean car, and somebody cuts you off and about takes the front end off of your car. Uh, maybe that gets you worked up. Uh, I, I will admit uh, that I have gotten pretty angry a few times. Uh, when somebody who had a yield sign cuts me off and uh, then blames me for it and, <laughs> and then gets mad at me. Uh, but uh, maybe, maybe road rage or traffic gets you worked up. But today we're going to see that Jesus got worked up about something. And that's kind of hard for us to understand because, or to even comprehend, because when we think of Jesus, <laughs> we think of Jesus as being gentle and meek and lowly. Uh, but here Jesus starts off his ministry with something that isn't what you typically hear about him. He got worked up. In fact, he got upset. No, I would say he got angry. And uh, we're going to read about this here in John chapter 2, verse 12 through 25. So grab your Bibles and join me. In John chapter 2, verse 12 tw through 25, it says, After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, typically, when somebody's in the Middle East, or not in the Middle East, in Israel, and they're going to Jerusalem, they go up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is up on a hill. So they were going, Passover's drawing near. It's about the same time of the year as it is now. You know, the Passover uh, was drawing near, and Jesus was doing what a lot of Jews did at this time of the year. They were going up to Jerusalem. In fact, uh, scholars believe that in this time frame, uh, about 80 to 100,000 people lived in Jerusalem. Uh, but that was the normal, I mean, that's a pretty big city, but that was the normal uh, uh, population. But here now, during the Passover, uh, probably more like uh, they think could, could all, the numbers could almost be up to half a million people uh, were in Jerusalem. So I imagine there wasn't any empty rooms uh, in Jerusalem. In fact, uh, people were probably camping out around the city. Uh, and why did they do that? Because they were coming there to worship at Passover. But look with me in verse 14. So they went up to Jerusalem for the Passover in verse 
13 and in verse 14, it says, And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And the, to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What then, or what sign do you show us as to the authority for you doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, Is it, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when they, were, when they was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning men, for he himself knew what was in man. Let's pray. God, I just pray, Lord, that right now you would just calm our hearts and calm our minds, and may we just focus on you. I know we're sitting in our homes and our living rooms and maybe at our dining room tables and and God, I just pray, Lord, that we could just get all of the distractions out of the way and allow you to speak to our heart through your word today. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, uh, use me and speak through me, and may every word that comes from my mouth come from your heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, here John presents a different or more a more theological view of Christ than the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and here John cleanses, or Jesus cleanses the temple here in John early in his ministry, which obviously uh, creates a lot of controversy. But Jesus cleanses the temple the last week of his life in the Synoptic Gospels. So uh, you might not realize this, but Jesus cleanses the temple twice. Uh, in fact, he repeated himself. Uh, so Jesus preached the same sermon twice. And oftentimes, you know, it takes more than once of us hearing God's word uh, before we respond to it. Uh, so we wonder how long did it take them to get their tables back up and running after Jesus left. But today I want to ask the question, what made Jesus angry? What made Jesus angry? Well, the first thing I think we find in verse 13 is that they misused God's temple. They misused God's temple. In verse 13 it says, the Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords. So he makes a whip here, and he takes that whip, and he drives all of them out. He drives out the money changers. He drives out the oxen. He drives out the animals. And then he takes all the coins and dumps them out on the ground, and, and he overturns their tables. I mean, uh, Maybe some of your uh, games of Monopoly during your uh, uh, lock-in here this last few weeks to turn into something like this. You flip the table and all the money goes everywhere. Uh, Monopoly gets kind of heated at our house. Uh, but uh, this is what he did. He, and he says, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. And then his disciples remembered a, a, a passage of scripture that says, zeal for your house will consume me. And and we see that this took place in the temple. But let's set the scene as to how we get there. You see, in the very beginning of the, of the passage, we, re we read that Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He was just doing what a lot of Jewish people do. And I mentioned that there was probably about half a million Jews uh, estimated that could be around the, the city at that time. And it was a requirement of every pilgrim to sacrifice an animal. Now, if you traveled quite a long ways, uh, you wouldn't want to necessarily bring your own animal. So what they would do is when you got to the temple, 
There would be a, 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 uh, a, a person selling animals. And all of these animals were already designated uh, good enough to be offered as a sacrifice. So one of the things that would happen is, is if you brought your own animal, perhaps you would get there and they would say, ah, oh, this is not enough. This ain't, th- there, there's a blemish. There's an issue with your animal. There's something wrong with it. You can't sacrifice that. So it was easier to purchase animals than to bring animals. Secondly, there was a temple tax required to paid, uh, to be paid, and the church authorities wanted pure money. In other words, they wanted temple money. So you came and you brought your money, uh, uh, foreign currency, if you will, uh, that, that, you, that you used on a daily basis. And when you got there, uh, you couldn't use that money because that money, and if you look at money today, all the money is the same. If you pull out your money today, what does it have on it? It has on it a picture of a man. See, it had a picture of a human. Foreign currency wasn't accepted. But what they would do is they would take your foreign currency and they would exchange it for temple currency. And you could use temple currency to pay the temple tax. And basically what they did was they set up this whole thing right in the uh, court of the Gentiles of the temple. And it was a racket. And Jesus wasn't complaining about buying animals and exchanging money. What really got him angry was where it was taking place. He said, my father's house, you made a place of business. You see, the court of the Gentiles was transformed from a place of worship and prayer to a place of merchandise. I mean, it would kind of be like, uh, imagine, picture this. You guys are all in here on a Sunday morning. I'm up here getting ready to preach or the worship, the praise band's up here playing. And uh, while all of this is going on, somebody walks around and they start selling popcorn here. We got popcorn here. And then another person's over here going, pop here. We're going to sell some pop. Anybody want to buy a pop? And you raise your hand and you're fishing money. I mean, noise is not conducive to worship. See, that was a holy place. In fact, that wasn't the first time God had dealt with them regarding their treatment of worship sacrifices in the temple. In fact, on Wednesday nights, before all of this went down, we're going through the book of Isaiah. And right off the bat, chapter 1 of Isaiah, chapter 1, Isaiah is prophesying to the kingdom of Judah. And listen to what he says. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So right off the bat, Isaiah prophesies in chapter 1, verse 10 here, against the kingdom of Judah, the place where, you know, the temple uh, was. And and what does he say? He says, look, you're like Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he goes on to verse 11, and he says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and fat of fed cattle, And I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Look at what he says in verse 13. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed festivals. They became a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. In other words, they had sin in their heart, but they approached God with solemn reverence. They, it would be like coming to church, knowing, I mean, having sin in your life and, and acting like there's nothing going on. In fact, not, it's, go, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's like, oh, praise you and thank you, Jesus, I'm forgiven. See, they had sin in their heart, but they approached with solemn reverence, and he says, I cannot endure iniquity. That word iniquity just means sin. I cannot endure iniquity in the, assom- in the solemn assembly. Then it goes on to say in verse 15, so when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes. In other words, I'm not going to listen to you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, even though you're praying more, there's sin in your life and you're not dealing with that sin. So what does he say? I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves 
Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan and plead for the widow. The idea here is that sin has to be dealt with. I heard a pastor say the holiness of God was lost on people. In other words, if you know, we don't. That's not a phrase that we really use much anymore. Was, uh, you know, if someone doesn't get a joke, you might say, "Well, the joke was lost on John." Uh, and I'm sure there's probably been quite a few jokes that have been lost on John. <laughs> but uh, but what does that mean? It means they didn't understand it and they weren't influenced by it. So the holiness of God was lost on His own people. They didn't understand it, and they weren't influenced by it. They, weren't, they didn't understand what it meant for God to be holy and how, what God re, uh, required of them. You see, that temple was holy ground. In fact, something is holy when it's set apart for the worship of God. That's what it means. When something's holy, it means it's set apart from the worship of God. Remember Moses? He was out in the desert minding his own business, and uh, he comes across, and, and there's a burning bush. And the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And, and uh, he, you know, he, he walks up, and then God speaks to him, and he says, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. In other words, that ground was set aside for the worship or set apart for the worship of God. And we are set apart for the worship of God. And we must be holy. Do we really understand the holiness of God? Are we influenced by it? See, Jesus, out of a righteous anger, cleansed the temple. He said, get out of here. You've turned my father's house, you've turned a place of worship into a place of business. Get this stuff out of here. Now, notice how the Jews responded. They didn't just arrest him. They knew their scriptures. They knew that there was a, a Messiah coming. And interestingly enough, they knew or they were more concerned about his authority than their own sin. They ask, well, by whose authority are you doing this? So why did Jesus do what he do? Well, in the answer is in verse 17. It says there, his disciples remembered it was written. Now, this is a psalm, but it wasn't necessarily considered a messianic psalm. Zeal for your house will consume me. So what we learn here is that God is very particular about how he is approached in worship in the sanctuary. This is a place of prayer. This is a place of worship. You need to take this seriously. And their response is, why should we listen to you? Why didn't they just throw him out? Well, like I said earlier, they knew their Old Testament scripture. Their problem was one of authority. You see, they had a problem of sin, and then they had a problem with somebody who was telling them that they were sinning. See, oftentimes that's how it is with us. We don't want to hear it when we're in the wrong, but we need to hear it. I think today we have a problem with authority. I mean, just look at our culture. It's from police officers to pastors. This raises a question that I think we must ask ourselves, and that is, does Jesus have authority let me say that again. Does Jesus have complete authority in your life? Do you really understand the holiness of God? Are you influenced by the holiness of God? In other words, is it changing how you act, who you are? See, if you're a Christian, you've been set apart for the worship of God, and God should get the glory in our life. You see, they misused the temple. They misused God's temple because they failed to understand the holiness of God and they weren't influenced by it. 
Well, the next thing we see is they misunderstood God's word. Jesus responds to them so really well in verse 18, but they missed it. They misunderstood God's word. Look at what it says there. It says, then the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us as to your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them. Now, this is kind of uh, a, a, a mysterious statement that he's saying here. Uh, obviously, they weren't, they weren't missing it. They weren't getting it. But this is what he said in verse 19. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then, then they, they said to him, well, wait a minute. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you'll, dis, you'll raise it up in three days? But look at verse 21, because here's the key to this passage. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. You see, they misunderstood him. He's, they thought he, they thought for because they were looking and they were thinking through physical, worldly, uh, fleshly eyes, and they thought, "Oh my, how are you going to raise this up in three days when it took forty-six years to build?" But he was talking about his body. And obviously, what was he prophesying about? He was prophesying about what we're going to celebrate next Sunday. In fact, we celebrate it every Sunday. That's why we have church on Sunday. But he rose from the grave. In other words, they would destroy the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, look at what it says in verse 22. His disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word. See that? They believed the word. You see, the Jews misunderstood the word, but it was revealed what it meant to the disciples, and they believed the word. So where is the temple today? Well, if you go to Jerusalem, and you go to, uh, you go to Israel, you go to Jerusalem, uh, where the temple once took, stood place, or stood, there is now a Muslim mosque, the Dome of the Rock. I mean, it might not be in the exact specific spot, but it's very close to where the temple was built. In fact, the Jews, uh, Israel doesn't even con necessarily control uh, that part uh, of, the, uh, of the temple mount. Uh, the closest that they get in worship is at the Western Wall. But where is the temple now? Well, the temple was destroyed. You see, many years at, or after Jesus... Uh, passed or rose from the dead the temple was destroyed but the jews now today are planning on building another temp temple in fact when i was in jerusalem in 90, 1997 it's been a long time ago and uh they were there's a place called the temple institute and they are getting the furniture ready for the new temple the garments that the priests will wear are there uh because they believe god will will uh uh, come and and give them the temple mount and allow them to rebuild the temple uh, and if you join us on our trip to Israel uh, next year uh, I, I, I don't know if we'll go to the temple institute but there's a good likelihood that we can uh, but we want to notice here that when Jesus died something miraculous happened that took place actually in the temple now it's not mentioned in the passage here but when Jesus died on the cross the veil of the temple, which separated basically the Jews and the world from God. The most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God dwelt in his Shekinah glory, where, uh, where he rested over the mercy seat, and uh, uh, where the glory of God shone, there was a big curtain that stood between humanity and God. And when Jesus died on the cross, something miraculous happened. The curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. Now, I think that's really interesting, from the top to the bottom, because that demonstrates that salvation is from God down to man. It's not through working. It's not through uh, self-righteousness. It's not through being a good person. But Jesus himself has now made access to God. Jesus was now the temple. In Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, in other words, we have confidence 
to go into the holy place. You know who went into the holy place? Only the high priest could go into the holy place, and he only went there once a year on the day of atonement to make atonement for the sins of Israel. But here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, it says, we have confidence to enter the holy place. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, we're going to take communion next week. And in communion, we celebrate two things, the blood and the body. And because of the sacrifice, not the one like they were making when Jesus was around, not the ones where they were bringing when Isaiah prophesied against them, but the perfect sacrifice that Jesus made now makes it available so that we, by the blood of Christ, can enter with confidence into the holy place. In verse 20 it says, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil. But he didn't inaugurate this veil through the veil that was on the temple. Let's keep reading. It says that is his flesh. You see, now he is the temple and the veil that separates the world from the glory of God is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, who is that priest? Jesus Christ. He's the priest and the sacrifice. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let's, let's take that scripture to heart as we find ourselves locked in our home uh, over the next four weeks. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, don't it? But uh, that's the situation we're in. But you know what? Let's consider Let's think about how to stimulate one another, to encourage one another, and do good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. You know what? We're not assembling together here today in person, but we're assembling together today here in heart and in spirit. Goes on to say, but encouraging one another. Right now, do you need encouragement? I want to encourage you, and I want to encourage you to encourage others. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's like almost that this Hebrews chapter 10 was written for our time that we're in right now. See, Jesus was the temple, and the temple has already been rebuilt. We're going to celebrate it next Sunday. Jesus rose from the, the grave. And now... Jesus ushers in a new temple and a mode of worship and a sacrifice has now been established. He is the new eternal temple dwelling with his people. Remember back in chapter 1 where it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us? That word dwelt is like tabernacled. He's like, he's, he's no longer dwelling in this temple that the Jews have turned into a place of business. He is dwelling in a new temple in the body of Jesus Christ. So where does God's glory shine today? Well, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it tells us, Paul writes there, do you not know that you are the temple of God? You see, before Jesus came, God dwelt in the temple that was in Jerusalem, and the Jews turned it into a place of business. And then when Jesus came, God dwelt in the person of Jesus Christ. And now that Jesus has raised from the dead and he's ascended back up into heaven, here Paul tells us that we are now the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in us. In verse 17 it says, If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is what? Holy. And that is what you are. And then he goes on, Paul goes on in chapter 6 of verse, uh, of 19, verse 19, and he goes, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. 
Don't misunderstand God's word. God's spirit dwells within his believers and his children. And Jesus has never left, or lost rather, his zeal for the temple. In fact, he's placed his spirit now in us, and he wants us to be clean. The question then is, what are we going to do with this great opportunity? You know, we can look at this quarantine in one of two ways. We can look at it as, this is terrible. We're stuck in our house. We can't go do anything fun. I mean, I have to put up with my kids. Uh, it's amazing how uh, negative sometimes that we can be. Or we can look at this as an opportunity to draw close to God and draw close to our family. You see, this can either make us bitter or it can make us better. Oftentimes when we don't assemble together, when we separate ourselves, that's what the devil wants. He wants to isolate us. And then we, 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 we get away from God, we get away from the children of God, we get away from the family of God, and that's why I'm telling you it's so important that you call each other. We get away from those things and what it can make us bitter. We can get angry, we can get upset, we can get depressed, we can, get, we can begin to worry. Or we can look at this as an opportunity. God's wanting to get my attention. God's wanting me to settle down. He wants me to slow down, pick up my Bible, because he wants to say something to me. Let's not misunderstand God's word, because that's what they did. They misunderstood God's word. They misused God's temple. And finally, they mistook God's salvation. Look, verse 23 it says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he knew what was in man. Well, there may have been some people that be truly believed, but I would say most of these people were only interested in his miracles. We see that throughout his life. You know, it's like the crowds start off really big when he's feeding them, when he's healing them. But then when he starts speaking truth into their heart, the crowds get smaller. See, it's quite possible that these people didn't have genuine faith, but rather superficial, shallow faith. They still wanted to be justified by their own works. You see, that's why people reject Jesus today. That's why uh, the Jews rejected him back then. Well, what, whom, they, they didn't want to admit their need for a savior. They wanted to say, well, we're keeping the law. We're keeping our, we're, we're doing these good things. The Bible tells us that our righteousness is a filthy rags. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. These people that that might have believed here in Jerusalem at the Passover uh, on this Sunday were yelling Hosanna, but on next Sunday they were yelling crucify him. See, they still wanted to be justified by their own righteousness. And our own righteousness is self-righteousness. And we will never be justified Justified's a, a, a Bible word, it's a theology word. It means basically just as if we had never sinned. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and we repent of our sin, and we believe that he died on the cross and that he raised from the dead, he was the substitutionary atonement for our sin, then he justifies us. In other words, when God looks at us, he doesn't see our righteousness anymore, which was as filthy rags, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. It's just as if when God looks at us, we have never sinned. But they mistook salvation. Perhaps maybe you've mistook salvation for going to church, for maybe even being baptized, or maybe giving to the poor or being a good person. You see, there is a person involved in salvation, but that person is Jesus Christ. 
It's about a personal relationship with a person, the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus warns us about this in Matthew 7. He says this in verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. And in your name we've cast out devils. And in your name we've done marvelous works. Then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I pray, Lord, that you listening to me today will not stand before God and hear him say, I never knew you. Those are the four worst words anyone could ever hear. And that's what these people did. They mistook God's salvation. They didn't know him. If you go on down and you read, it it, it says that his disciples believed His disciples believed. Have you ever repented of your sin and put your faith and trust, truly believed, not just up here, but down here, in your heart, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died on the cross for you because that's what John is written for. He writes these things so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through being baptized, not through uh, uh, being a good person, not through coming to church, not through taking membership, not through working a ministry, not through teaching Sunday school, not even from preaching. We're saved through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Today, do you know him? Perhaps if you do, does your temple need cleansed? How does God cleanse our temple? You know, how how can we have our temple cleansed? Well, I think the first step is start reading his word. Start spending time in his word. You see, when people hear the word of Christ, the word of God. When people draw close to God, something happens. In fact, Peter, he, 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 it happened to Peter. Peter was in his boat, and he said, hey, you know, I, I, I want you to take and cast your nets on the other side. Peter's like, I've fished all night. Look, you don't understand. I'm a professional at this. I fished all night and caught any, I haven't caught anything. It's like, cast your net on the other side of the boat does and what does he do he pulls in such a big catch the nets broke he got up to jesus this is what he said he said depart from me for i'm a sinful man and then there's two words on the end of that sentence depart from me for i'm a sinful man O lord See, when we draw close to God, we realize how holy God is and how sinful we are. You see, the Bible is not just a self-help, the Bible is not a self-help book, but it's a book showing and demonstrating the holiness and the glory of God. And the more we read it, the more our lives should be transformed, the more we should approach the temple in reverence and deal with the sin that is in the temple Jesus sometimes needs to come in and deal with our sin. He needs to flip some tables in our life. He needs to throw some money on the ground. He needs to drive out. And and what might that look like? It might might look like, uh, you know, us giving up something that we know is wrong. Maybe it's a hobby that's become a God. Maybe it's a career that's become a God. See, sometimes God has to shake up our lives to get us our, get our attention. Why? Because he wants to make us holy because we have now been set apart for worship. If God comes into your temple and looks around, what will he find? 
He needs to find holiness. He wants to make us make us holy. First, he justifies us. I mentioned earlier that's just as if we have never sinned. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, and we stop trying to be a good person, we stop trying to work to gain God's approval, and we realize that there's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can do. We're hopeless without Christ. And we put all of our faith, all of our trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. I'm really thankful for this cross. Uh, you pr- might not be able to see it, but down on the bottom, it's, it's got thorns because that represents sin. You know, when, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, the ground was cursed, and now it, it, it just produces thorns and thistles. And down at the bottom is thorns and thistles. That reduces, re- represents sin. But as it goes up, it turns into lilies, which represent life. Because that's what Jesus Christ did. He died on the cross for our sin, and he justifies those who trust in him. Then, after he justifies us, we begin a process, and this process is called sanctification. He sanctifies us. What does that mean? It, it's setting us apart, making us holy for worship. Sanctification might require some flipping of some tables in our lives. Today, I want to ask you to invite Christ and to take a look at your temple and reveal to you what needs to leave. And I pray that you have the courage to allow him to drive it out and to keep it out so that we can be holy and that we can worship God in spirit and in truth and not come worshiping in a lie. See, Jesus told us, if you come to the altar to make a sacrifice and you find it and you remember that you have an odd against your brother, Don't even make that. Go and get that ought straightened out. Go and work that out with that person. Maybe that's something that you need to do today. Maybe you need to get on the phone and call somebody who you have an issue with and work that out because you can't continue to worship God with sin in your life. God needs to come in and clean it up. And we need to allow God, we need to allow Jesus to come into our temple and drive us some stuff out so that we can worship in spirit and we can worship in truth, not a lie. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day and for this time that we've come together. And I thank you for everyone who is listening and watching online. I pray, Lord, that you would keep them safe. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them and their families. I pray, Lord, that right now in in this moment, quiet moment in their living room, that they would allow you to speak to their hearts and that lives would be surrendered to you, that your word would not be misunderstood, that people would trust in you, Jesus, not in a religion, not in a baptism, not in a church membership, not in being a good person, but nothing more than you and what you did for us. God, I pray, Lord, for all of the doctors and nurses who are hearing this and listening to this today and for all of those who are uh, first responders who are dealing with people up close and personal even though the rest of us are trying to maintain a, 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 a social distance God I pray for those people that you would just protect them that you would just keep them safe and there's several of those in our congregation God and I just ask that you would have your hand upon them that you would Uh, that they would just shelter under your wing and that you would look over them and keep them safe. And God, I pray for our nation, God. I pray for our nation that it doesn't miss this opportunity to repent of its sin and come back to you. And God, we look forward to celebrating your resurrection next Sunday. And uh, we know that that, uh, Friday is gonna be here, but Sunday's coming. And we know that 
you had to suffer and die on the cross, but thank God it didn't end there. The suffering, the agony, the torture, the weight of the sin of this world, the guilt and the shame that you bore uh, might have been around for a Friday, but thank God Sunday's coming, and we look forward to that Sunday, and we want to celebrate it with each other, and we want to celebrate it with you, and we know that where two or more are gathered, you are in the midst, of, we know that you're in the midst here today with us, and we just thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.